here's how bad I was with money. When I realized I could get student loans, I'm like, oh, I can get a computer with a student loan. I did not want a computer to work on school. I wanted a computer because there was this killer video game called Railroad Tycoon by Sid Meier that was fantastic. It was before SimCity. So I went and I applied for student loans, which helped me a little bit with school, but really helped me begin playing video games. There was a day I'm driving this old dilapidated Ford Aerostar minivan. My wife and I have young twins at that point, and I ran out of gas. I'm going through the seats and I'm going through the floorboards looking for change because I have no money. And I found $2.50, which way back then just barely bought me enough gas to get in my driveway so that I could go home and go to work another day. This is the Personal Finance Show. Hi, I'm Bo Humphreys, and this is The Personal Finance Show. Joe Saul Cihai wants you to learn about money, but he doesn't want you to think you're learning anything. Joe is the creator and co-host of The Stacking Benjamins Show, one of the top personal finance podcasts in North America. Joe also co-hosts a new podcast called Money in the Morning. The running joke on Stacking Benjamins is that you won't learn anything about money by listening to the show, and if you do learn something... You should keep it to yourself. Joe figured out a way to make personal finance fun and entertaining and somehow got over 130,000 people to subscribe to the Stacking Benjamins podcast along the way. I'm very happy to have Joe on the show, and I'm flattered that he has invited me to be on the infamous Stacking Benjamins roundtable coming up on a Friday sometime in the next few months. Joe joined me from Detroit, Michigan to share his personal finance story. really remember my exact first money memory outside of whenever my parents were talking about money, my brother and I, if we walked in the room, immediately the conversation stopped and we (sighs) were kicked out of the room. I remember entrepreneurship and money though at a at an early age being tied together. My parents had a big, huge garden. My grandparents were farmers. So I was always used to going to my grandparents' house and picking blueberries or apples. Uh, We were the fruit farm people. In fact, oh, nice! I was a pretty good runner in high school. And when I would show up on the starting line and they'd announce my name, the person next to me more often than not would go, are you the blueberry people? Yes, (laughs) we are. We are the blueberry people. This is Michigan? This is Michigan. Yeah. West Michigan is known for, for, uh, fruit, not as much as like Washington state, okay. but, uh, maybe a close second. I remember those though. I remember, I remember my, my, my grandpa always selling stuff. My parents had a garden and we'd always have too much zucchini. Everybody who's grown zucchini knows what I'm talking about. We'd have way too much of that. We'd have a lot of corn. So my brother and I would go down to the road and we had a little stand by the road. And my brother and I would get to keep half of whatever we sold that stuff for. This is just from a home garden? Like, yeah. But your grandparents had the fruit farm. Had the fruit farm, yeah. So yeah. At, our, at our house, my parents gave us, my dad worked for General Motors, so he couldn't take care of it. So my brother and I all summer long would take care of the garden, and then we get to keep whatever half of the money was. So my early days of money it was thinking about all the crap I was going to buy. <laughs> <laughs> you just had a, a list lined up, like you checking them off? And none of it was any good. <laughs> and, you know, my parents were great at knowing how to be a great employee, about how to work well with people, about how to communicate, but money always slipped right through their fingers. And, you know, I, I had this list of stuff and they let me buy whatever it was. I got a 12 speed bike that I broke immediately. I think I rode it like four times. <laughs> I bought a record player right as eight tracks, right? This is, I'm going to date myself, but right as eight tracks <laughs> went out, I bought this record player that was just horrible. I buy, I buy HO train stuff. Cause I was going to have a train set someday. I still have this box full of train stuff. I've never set up a train set once. You still have it. 
Well, I've got one box. My mom recently gave it back to me like three years ago. She's like, here, this is a bit of my attic. Now it's going to be in yours. So I think it's going to go on eBay very soon. Do you want it? <laughs> no, no, thank you. If, you. if you have a train hobby, it sounds like you could just go crazy with it. Yeah. Len Penzo, who's on our Stacky Benjamin show, is a train enthusiast. And he said, okay. he says the eBay dude is a slippery slope. Like, <laughs> yeah, the train hobby, just do not go together because you always go, oh, that model looks cool. Yeah, exactly. So you're making money from a uh, home garden and but you're going to pick stuff with your grandparents, but you're not making any money off of that. But you're seeing them rake it in from the berries. I, I think he might have. I don't know that he was raking it in, but he was actually making an income. Right. He was able yeah. to live. And I think that on weekends, grand grandkids were just expected to help the farm. Yeah. Okay. So we would go there. My brother and I, my cousin was one year younger than me, my brother, two years younger than me. So the three of us always hung out together. And when we put pick blueberries, it was one in my mouth, one in the can, one in my mouth, one in the can. <laughs> And then we spend, be. we spend all afternoon rolling around on the floor with the world's biggest stomach ache. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, Halloween every day. It was great. I mean, just imagine <laughs> so many blueberries, which are wonderful or fantastic, but so many that you're like, I can't eat anymore. Yeah, I know. I don't think I've ever done that. I've, I've never had so many blueberries that I didn't want anymore. Well, you I and I, the next time we get together, we're going to get a few quarts of blueberries and we're going to throw down. <laughs> it's the, this is the grown ups uh, shot for shot. <laughs> Uh, thing with blue, <laughs> blueberry, blueberries, it's gonna go viral. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll put it on. We'll put it all over YouTube. You'll see us in a twelve-step program <laughs> about blueberries. Big, big blueberry stains all over our faces. <laughs> <laughs> so you're making money from from family stuff or from your own stuff. Let's. That sounds like little money. Yeah. Uh, when do you actually like start to get a, a paycheck or like, you know, cash under the table from somebody else? That was that was in high school. And in, in, yeah. so in high school, my first job was working in the fields that were around us working in cornfields, doing this job called detasseling, which was a horrible job. But I got really good at it. In fact, I became the youngest supervisor they ever hired. I was still in high school when they hired me to be a supervisor. Everybody else was a school teacher that was off for the summer. And wow. uh, and I got to be a supervisor, too, because I was I was pretty good at that. What do you do? Can you explain it? Yeah. So farmers grow these varieties of corn that aren't made naturally. So what happens with corn is a lot like what happens with humans. I'm about to tell you the corn birds and the bees, Bo. This is the I love it. So corn has that flowery top that comes out. Yeah. And those little seeds, when the wind blows, they stick down in the corn. And then that's where the kernels of corn come from. Okay. So what we have to do is make sure that for those corn kernels to come out, we want to breed one stalk with a different uh, flower. So you'll have a few rows of flowers from one type of corn. And from the other type of corn, you had to take all those flowers out before they came out. So while they were still just a green stalk at the top of the corn, they take these machines full of high school kids and you would go thumbs down so the top would pop out of the top of the corn stalk, you go down and you pull all of these stalks off hand over hand going down a field uh, to make sure that they never, ever ended up uh, procreating that because wow. what we wanted was for the wind to blow and the other stalk of corn to procreate with that. So that's how you made hybrid corn. And most of West Michigan was that. And so I made decent money that year. Once again, didn't save any of it. Saved absolutely none of it, but <laughs> well, that's to be expected. Yeah. Also, the, the the I always find out about new jobs on the podcast, but also uh, driving people around for Uber. Like I uh, genetically engineer chickens. Somebody said once, and I'm like, what? Like what? Like that's a thing. I don't. You know, so there's so many jobs that we don't even know exist. And so you were, yeah, you were forcing a certain type of corn to be made. Yeah. But to your point, when I was a financial planner, it was the same. There were people. Oh, of course. Yeah. I would meet people. I remember meeting this one couple. I'm like, so what do you do for a living? We collect goat hair. <laughs> and then they sell it for wigs. Like that is their business. They had these goats and their main goal was to collect it for wigs. 
I, I would say I don't believe you, but no one could have made that up. <laughs> I was hoping they made it up and I was trying to not laugh because, you know, everybody's got their thing, right? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there shouldn't be any judgment. But immediately the guy, I was a brand new financial planner, by the way, which meant I had a I had a trainer in the room with me. The people in the the people, by the way, across the table did not know that he was my trainer. They just thought we okay. were two planners that were meeting with them. And immediately <laughs> my trainer starts kicking me under the table. As he, as, <laughs> as he's spurring them on to talk more and more about the goats. So what type of goats are they? Are oh they my God. Your goats. And he's kicking me, trying to make me laugh. And I'm, uh, oh, it was horrible. What a position to put you in. You're trying to take these people seriously. Absolutely. Right? Nobody deserves to be taken not seriously with whatever they do. I mean, there should be any judgment there, but you know, tales from the financial professional world, especially in those days when it was all high commission sales. I remember being mm. taught how to pressure people to buy stuff back from those days. I can tell you just horror story after horror story from those. Well, days. we're going to get, we're going to get there uh, <laughs> along the timeline. Oh boy. Uh, Cause I, I, we need to know how you got to be a, be a, a financial uh, planner in the first place. So in college, I continued to be bad with money. Okay. <laughs> I got a scholarship to run cross country and track for the Citadel. Oh, that's great. Full scholarship. Uh, almost full. I had to okay. pay for books in my uniform. Oh, that's and- easy. For people that don't know about the Citadel, it's the Military College of South Carolina. Really good school, but it was a, it was military. So so just so people know ahead of time, I couldn't have a job because it was a military college and you would do military stuff when you weren't in classes. Oh, That didn't stop, though. A credit card company, the very first <laughs> week I'm in school, of having a credit card application table at Mark Clark Hall, like our student union. So I walk in there my first week. American Express is there. I sign up for an American Express card. I put down that I have no income. Yeah. I put down that I'm at a military college. They gave me a credit card. <laughs> what? Well, how much? Uh, you know, it's funny. The American Express card at that time didn't have credit limits. It was yeah. in full every month, right? So like it could be $250,000. <laughs> could have been whatever. All I know was if it was $6, it was more money than I had. And well, yeah. I had no ability to, I couldn't go do anything. So the first Saturday we had leave, which was a couple of weeks after I got the card, I immediately told all my buddies that lunch was going to be on me. <laughs> and we went out to North Charleston, South Carolina to lunch at this mall. And we went to a, you know, at the time it felt like a high end place. It was probably you know, like a Max and Irma's or a, uh, some regional chain, but I bought for everybody. Oh man. Because I had a credit card. And then I went into the mall. I went to Nordstrom. And I, <laughs> which is not a cheap store. Yeah. First, first mistake. Yes. And, and I find this sweater and I've kept the sweater by the way. And it, and it, it it's horrible. It would look great in like a Duran Duran video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I buy this sweater and I'm just big man on campus. And then three weeks later, the bill shows up and I had never once thought about how am I going to pay for this? Okay. So let's, let's step back for a sec. Uh, your, your parents, they weren't talking about money because they uh, shut up when you walked into the room, Yeah, but they never mentioned anything about like credit cards or anything Maybe like that Maybe offhand. You? you know what I mean? Like offhand. I yeah. Just like stuff. whatever. Right. I, yeah. But I thought, oh, my goodness, I got this credit card. And I should have thought about, like, even when I signed up, I knew how it worked. I knew the rules, but I didn't really know. I had no, and I'm not blaming my parents. I'm not like, no, no, no. I'm not on the personal finance show throwing my parents under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I like, try not to throw them under the bus, but you know what? Okay, let's just, for your parents' sake here, even if your parents would have been like, uh, giving you a course on credit cards, you know, when you were at home, like every night you're talking about credit cards. It wouldn't have mattered, right? Uh, it, apparently, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the guests, his mom was a banker and, and she had to like line into his bank account. Didn't help him, you know, like it doesn't matter. Your parents can say anything or nothing. It's all up to you. I actually will disagree. I will throw him under the bus a little bit, but then I'm going to okay. take it Okay. Back. I was trying to help you out, Joe, but <laughs> go ahead. I think, I think had they talked to me about money, 
I personally would have done better. And I know my okay. kids, I look at my, so I have twins now that are 24. They're doing phenomenally well financially and, and okay. the stuff that they know, cause we would have these financial geek conversations at our table that we never had. They do very well. They're very financially savvy, but I'll, but, but I will say this, I'll defend my parents this way. There's so many parents, like you meet people all the time. It is so taboo to have this talk that you and I are having now. Oh, yeah. 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 So th- th- this discussion never happens. And so it isn't my parents. It's it's the time they lived in. It's the fact that you don't talk about money. You don't talk about religion. You don't talk about politics. Right. I agree with religion and politics, but money. Well, w- why don't we talk about money? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I'll back off that way and say it's more a product of their time and not that my parents were bad people. How about that? So so the lesson then is talk to your kids about money and then if they don't do anything about it, then at least you can say you tried because that's that's what happens. It's like, yeah, sure. Uh, if you don't talk to somebody about money, they might have been uh, uh, been able to uh, improve themselves like you're saying. But if you talk to them, you can't guarantee they're going to take your advice. They might rebel um, as children do. Yeah. Like my mom says, you know, the whole thing about you can lead a horse to water and you probably should. Well, do your best. Absolutely. And at some point you have to say, you know what? I did everything I could, but that, that was not my situation. So the bill came. Yeah. What'd you do? Well, I called my mom. (laughs) Of course. And I said, I said, Hey, uh, so I got this credit card bill and she went off. You what? You, why'd you get a, what are you talking? You're at a military college. I'm like, I know I'm in big trouble. I got to pay this bill. I got like 30 yeah. days. And my mom did the right thing, which was, she said, figure it out. Oh, okay. Wow. Now, Hard knocks. yeah, what she knew and what I knew was going to happen, happened 90 days later, my credit card was taken away. My credit okay. was ruined for the next seven years. Uh, because oh, yeah. it was taken away. It went to collections. When I had my uh, job that next summer, I spent the first couple months paying off the credit card, the interest, the whatever. I mean, and it wasn't a ton of money. I mean, in the big scheme of things, I think it was two hundred dollars. But after interest and fees and penalties and all that, I think I owed three fifty by the time yeah. I paid it back. So, and you and, know, a college job, summer job, that took me a while to get that money. Wow. So all that, like for a couple hundred bucks, the credit rating thing, did that, uh, you know, jumping ahead, did that affect you for anything important that you wanted to do in those seven years? Well, it made me realize that I couldn't have credit from two yeah. standpoints. Number one, I realized I was not good with credit. Like I learned early, like you touch the stove once, right? You're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not touching that again. I'd see credit cards. I'm like, nope, can't do that. That that is not an option. And then number two was I knew it was an option because I knew that they knew my credit too. So even if I wanted to to be an option, I knew enough about credit then going through the whole collections process that I wasn't going to be given another one. If I'd applied for another one, I thought they'd, they'd laugh at me. So I had a bunch of shame and felt, you know, horrible with money. And actually it was funny then as I was going part-time job to part-time job, I, I transferred to Michigan state after two years, I got hurt my sophomore year of college. I realized that running wasn't going to be in my future anymore. So I came back to Michigan while I was there. I had to work to pay my way through school because my parents weren't funding any of it. So I had name a bad job. I had it. And Mm. I was working all these different jobs, just trying to make sure that I got tuition paid and I was able to afford my rent every month. I learned the hard way about budgeting and about how life works, but I still, I still was not great with money. I mean, I still was a failure. I did a bunch of things wrong. As an example, my scholarship was guaranteed. I left because I felt guilty about the track and cross country team not being able to use me and I wasn't earning my money. It did, so it didn't matter that you weren't uh, running anymore. I could have gone to college for free for or, or most I mean, free. And I can I, understand that. I can understand not feeling like that, like you belong there. Is that what you're you're saying? Oh, yeah. I thought I was taking money that I didn't really deserve. I was giving nothing back. So. Yeah. I felt this guilt, but then my coach even explained to me, Bo, he sat down with me and he explained to me, he's like, I get that. That's very honorable. I can't give the scholarship to anybody else. Okay. So, so, so you can, he said, maybe your senior year, I might, you know, be able to give to somebody else, but for the next year and a half, it's already got your name on it. I'm like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go now. Wow. So you, you left. 
And I overpaid. I ended up overpaying for college and I made my situation worse. People are wondering now how the hell I got into finance. Like, how does that? (laughs) Well, they say the same thing to me, too. (laughs) On my YouTube video comments, why would I trust you with money? (laughs) Your hair is long. (laughs) I I genetically don't have that problem. (laughs) It's genetics. Uh, This guy looks like he's bad with money. (laughs) I was managing a telemarketing program for a water treatment company. It's one of my bad jobs. And I'd actually worked my way up off the phones. I was calling people, asking them if they wanted a water test so we could sell them a water softener. Oh, boy. Yeah, that was that that was fun. But I worked my way up to supervisor because I, you know, I'm I'm a workaholic and uh, and I learned how to be good at that. So they they made me the supervisor. I was in charge of the program. And one day I get a call from a friend of mine and I'm just about at graduation at this point, it took me seven years of paying my own way after mm. two years of scholarship it took me seven years to get my bachelor's. So, wow. Okay. It, wow. Yeah. Just because I'm taking a few classes at a time so I can pay for it. Wait, wait, sorry to interrupt you. You can't get student loans or you can, or they don't I exist. Did. I did. Okay. Because, okay. So, so this we'll is, we'll come back to that. Well, well, we could talk about that right now because uh, the, the thing that was funny about that was that here's how bad I was with money. When I realized I could get student loans, I said, oh, my God, I can finally afford a computer. I <laughs> I did not want a computer to work on school. I wanted a computer because there was this killer video game called <laughs> Railroad Tycoon by Sid Meier. Yes. Fantastic. It was just it was before SimCity. It was yeah, yeah. an awesome thing. A friend of mine had it. I'm like, oh, I can get a computer with a student loan. So I went and I applied for student loans, which helped me a little bit with school, but really helped me begin playing video games. Wow. I love that you made all of the mistakes. This is oh, yeah. really a great story so far. <laughs> if if people wonder about mistakes and, and I've I've made them all. So when, when I look when I was a financial planner and I was a good financial planner, which we can get to, it, yes. I, I, I could look people in the eye and I could tell them about the emotions they were having because I had them and I could yeah. tell them about the mistakes that they've made and what was going to happen next. Cause it happened to me. And so it, it made me very good as a coach. So I'm, I'm managing the telemarketing department. Yeah. I get this call from a friend of mine at this company that, that later on would be acquired. Well, I'll get to that in a second. He calls me up and he says, Joe, we're hiring financial planners right now for our company. And this is a direct quote. He said, we normally don't hire people like you, but I think you'd be good at this. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, people, what category were you in for him in his mind? English creative writing major. Yeah. Okay. Dude, yeah. That, dude that doesn't have a background at all related to money, trying to be a great American author. But at the same time, I'd seen the movie Wall Street and I'd loved it. I thought it was yes. cool. I th- the world of stocks and bonds, although I wasn't in it, I didn't have any cash. I, f- I was following it a little bit because it interests me, but it, it el- the jargon eluded me. And Railroad Tycoon, uh, that's a pretty good giveaway too. Yes. It being <laughs> your yes. dream game to build uh, uh, virtual railroads. <laughs> yeah. In, and, and you'd invest in your competitors' railroads. Yes. So, so I'm doing this stuff on, on the computer. And I saw these people on the Today Show and on uh, other, you know, uh, uh, morning American TV shows where this expert comes on. I'm sure CBC has the same stuff. I mean, oh, yeah. This expert comes on and they're telling you that the utility company will allow you to do level payments. Um, or they're telling you about how to get through a grocery store without spending your whole paycheck. I thought those people were super cool. Yeah. And, and so in my head, I'm like, wow, I can teach people these magic tricks around money and I can get involved in this sexy world of stocks and bonds. This is going to be fantastic. This is a dream, dream for you. And, yeah. and just to clarify, so far you've done nothing in the media, right? I had done nothing yet media wise. Okay. Okay. No. So yeah. So we're like, it's not like you're even. I'm doing this on the side, and eventually you're gonna, no. you know, right. you're you you're you're only seeing these people on uh, on the TV and right. being like that they're cool, but you're not like I'm gonna be one of them. Or you at that point you were like I want to be on TV. No. no, 
I just no. thought they were really cool. I yeah, thought okay. I can do that, not be on TV, but if I can teach people that, that would be neat. I will okay. tell you though, and this is how I got into financial media was to, as one of those jobs to pay my way through high school and college. The one entrepreneurial thing I did was I built a small disc jockey company as one of those. Ah, okay. Cause it was a great way. You know, I could have a job in the morning delivering papers. I could have a job in the middle of the day between classes. I was building radiation walls at the cyclotron at Michigan state university. Wow. Uh, so, and then at night I would go DJ a college party, a wedding reception, a high school dance, whatever. And I bought equipment for that. Uh, I, I would just, I would, well, we started it when I was in high school, but I continued when I was in college. I ended up at one point, I had two other DJs that worked for me. We had three systems going different places, but it was standing in front of people as a DJ that was like the early part. Yeah. Of, yeah. Like this is DJing, like you're spinning records, but you're also talking uh, yeah. to yeah. people and getting them going and stuff like that. Too, I right? was, I was leading the hokey pokey. Yeah. And the chicken <laughs> dance. I was getting high schoolers fired up because they just beaten three rivers in the game just before the, the basketball game, just before the dance. And I was riling them wow. up or at Michigan state when they upset Iowa, you know, uh, and I'm at Sigma Chi disc jockeying their party. I'm <laughs> fired up. So yeah, learning how to create a mood was something that I'd been working on. You know, everybody talks about 10,000 hours, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Uh, yep. I had 10,000 hours and I can get to how I got into financial media, but I, I had 10,000 hours of that by the time I even started. When I got recruited to do media for my company, at first I was very afraid of it. And then they said, no, 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 we'll give you scripts about what to say. We're just worried that you will be afraid to stand up in front of people. I'm like, are you kidding oh, me? Yeah. I'm not afraid at all to stand up in front of people. I have no idea what to say, though. I was a second year financial planner or excuse me, third year financial planner. And I'm going to be teaching people about uh, big groups of people that work for different companies or people going to what we would call a rubber chicken dinner. My job was to be good enough that if you were a financial advisor, you would buy the dinner, you would put a mailer out, you would invite me to be the guy who is the higher gun to come in. I see. Okay. Make us all sound wonderful. So it took you three years of you had to build up a client list and that kind of thing on your own. I got a lot of training and this is, this is, this is funny, Bo, the, the company, and I said, I'd get back to this later that hired me. Yeah. Was American Express. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, okay. American Express had financial planners? They did. So there was a company called IDS. IDS was purchased by American Express. We really? became American Express Financial Advisors, the Financial Advisors Division. Later on, that company now is known as Ameriprise. It got spun off and it's now, it is now Ameriprise. But at the time, it was okay. American Express Financial Advisors. But the same company that had taken away my credit card yes. offered me to advise other people to manage money. How about that for a turn, huh? The, this is irony, right? It is so great. <laughs> I got the last laugh on that one. Wow. You're, well, at least you like you collected a bunch of money from them, hopefully. Yeah. At the start, which was in the early mid nineties, I, you know, 94, 95, uh, I started in 90, uh, ended 93 with my career. The, um, the industry was changing. So when I started off, it was all commission, but very, mm -hmm. very soon within a year, it was a uh, fee based with commissions attached, meaning people would pay me a fee to do a financial plan, but then there yeah. were financial products behind it that I would get commissions on that continued to morph more and more toward fees and away from commissions during my whole career, where at the point, at the point that I left, I was still a fee-based planner, which meant there were some commissions, but not many. My my compensation went from a hundred percent commission when I started to probably ninety percent fee, ten percent commission when I left after sixteen years. But you don't have to sell these funds, or you do? Is it the only products that you have? At the beginning, yes. And they were all American Express products at the beginning. Later on, the longer I went, the more the investments in the products became commodities. And my platform got bigger and bigger of what, you know, the American Express deemed was suitable to the point that you could have gone to me, to Fidelity, to whoever. If you go to Ameriprise yeah. now, you go to Ameriprise now, you can get all the same stuff that you can get elsewhere. I mean, there, you know, somebody might write in and say, well, I, I beg to differ, but okay. Everybody has little sliver. But generally speaking, there's thousands of things on the Ameriprise platform, like there's thousands of things on the Fidelity platform. 
And so I usually, you know, once people get into financial services working, I ask, how are your personal finances at this point? Have they changed? Are you better? Are you still not saving money? Well, mine, mine changed a lot. I mean, I can, I, I continued to screw things up. And at the end of my, <laughs> near the end of my first year, I got a monster commission from a gentleman uh, from Japan. He was oh. an executive with a Japanese audio company who worked in our area. And I got a monster commission. He went to Japan right after that. There's a thing on insurance products called a 10 day free look. I took all that money. I paid off debts that I had because I had that credit card. I had owed some family members money because I hadn't gotten credit. I had my student loans. I paid off a bunch of stuff. I got a financial cushion. The guy came back five months later uh, from Japan. And because he'd never signed the 10 day free look paperwork, he signed it. He still had 10 days. His account, oh. his accountant also sold financial stuff, found out that he had done all these things with me and reversed it all. So then oh. I owed my company, I owed American Express uh, about $50,000. Again? Yeah. You owe American Express. <laughs> and so now I was back in the hole. And now I could have, oh. I could have quit. I could have quit the yeah. company. And by the way, had I done that, I was even told then, had I quit the company, they would have come after me. My credit would have probably been been wrecked, but I would again. have get back. But that's, once again, that's not me. I had made that no. monster. I was going to pay it back. And so I spent the next year where I brought home $12,000 because every other dollar oh. I made was paying off that debt. Wow. And the only benefit to this is that you had paid off other things. The bad news is by that time I had just gotten credit cards, new credit cards, okay. and, and I wrecked them. Uh, I wrecked my credit again. My, my end of my first year as a financial planner, wrecked my credit completely again. Uh, again. I, I had creditors calling me all the time then. This one was way worse. This was way worse than that first time. It was horrible because I thought I had my act together. And, um, and when there's this no bankruptcy happened, yet, there's no like you, no, you're no. not, you maybe are not the type who would uh, consider bankruptcy. Uh, I just, yeah, it was never really on the table. I was, yeah. there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I just sure. thought if I can live through the next year, I'm good enough at this. And I could see my business was building. You know what I mean? I wasn't making more money, but I was going okay. out every day working okay. on building my business. But I'll tell you, there were days, man. There was a day I'm driving this old dilapidated Ford Aerostar minivan. My wife and I have young twins at that point, And I ran out of gas. I'm going through the seats. And I'm going through the floorboards looking for change because I have no money and my wife has no way to come get me. And I found $2.50, which way back then just barely bought me enough gas to get in my driveway so that I could, wow. so that I could go home and go to work another day. So it took you one more of these seven year periods. I'm, I'm guessing yeah, I know. I'm not going to guess that you uh, uh, learned your lesson. <laughs> well, are, it there, was, are there more? Yeah, no, nope, nope. Not well. Th th there's actually one more, and I've told the story elsewhere, so I might as well tell it here too. During that time too, I also this was the other kick in the butt. My first year, I did pretty well as a as a first year financial planner. I had made around eighty five thousand bucks. Oh which, wow, yeah, which was a great first year. And like I said, I paid off my debts. I I but but then I lived a decent lifestyle. I realized at the end of my first year that I should probably hire an accountant to do my taxes. Okay. And I and the way we were paid by American Express was we were and some people ended up in uh, big fights with American Express about this, but mm. we were we were paid as independent contractors, meaning and I didn't know how this worked, I had to withhold my own taxes. Even though it was your only job, it was your only job at the time. I was fading away from disc jockeying. I didn't have time anymore. There was no future in that. I was I was definitely just ending all the contracts I had outstanding. I was finishing up. But, but the majority but of your time was spent. 99% of my yeah, time yeah. Was, was spent there. So I'm an independent contractor. So uh, uh, so in March, I go, I go see uh, this accountant. And the accountant that I was referred to was horrible. He was just a guy that threw numbers in and he said, okay, what receipts do you have? I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, did you keep receipts? Did you keep your mileage? Did you keep oh. all these things that in the United States are write offable? Yeah. I 
kept none of it. So he said, well, get me whatever you can. So, you know, I came up with a few hundred dollars worth of stuff. Now, in high- <laughs> had I had good advice, I would have probably not owed much in the way of taxes. I probably, yeah. frankly, frankly, wouldn't have. And I would have been able to pay or come close to paying or find somebody to help me pay the tax that I owed. But because I had nothing, he told me I owed close to $20,000 in taxes. Yeah, sounds about right. So I did oh. the thing any irresponsible person would do. I decided that if I didn't pay attention to it, it would go away. <laughs> and I would be able to, I would be able to make my first, I, I blew up at the guy. I'm like, are you kidding me? How come you didn't tell me, you know, why, why? Like I, I had, I talked to him six months before about the fact I was going to hire him. And then I brought him my stuff. I thought it was, I'm like, you're, you're telling me this at the last minute. And he looks at me, he's like, you're a financial planner. I'm like, that doesn't mean I I didn't know anything yet. I was brand spanking new. I'm this guy who's an English major. None of this is an excuse, by the way. Totally. No, but but people do make assumptions if you're in financial services. That That you know what you're doing? That you know. Well, it's funny. Like, uh, you know, I had spoken to other people who are like have an accounting degree, but they don't teach personal finance, even if you would have had a finance degree. When I was a, a fourth or a fifth year advisor, I remember hearing Susie Orman say, do not hire an advisor without 10 years of experience. I mm. remember saying that is baloney. I will <laughs> take you under my wing. I'm going to be great. You know what I think now, Bo? Yeah. Don't hire anybody who hasn't been in the business 10 years. <laughs> Do not. And even now at 10 years, this economic cycle has gone on long enough, right? This oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right. In the business 10 years haven't seen a downturn. I feel like a lot of people don't know how to deal with whatever's going to happen and how to explain that to people and you know housing markets too and it, yeah everybody's just so like uh pie in the sky like everything's going to keep going up forever i went through two of them and yeah. they're horrible and sure. i saw you know the second one that 2007 2008 50 percent of the financial advisors out there washed out 50 yeah. percent washed out so yeah, there's people with 10 years experience now that I think will wash out. Can you talk about that for a sec? Yeah. Do you think that they did not prepare their clientele for something to happen or a possibility of this? Is that why they washed out? Because like, I'm assuming you mean that they lost all of their clients because uh, they, they cashed out. There's a few reasons. Number one would be that they couldn't take it when all their clients go into revolt mode. Because yes, I'll tell you, yeah. no matter how good you are, your clients go into revolt mode. Sure. And, and you're you're answering stuff every day. And I learned very quickly a great book that I love. It's incredibly dry, but it's Sun Tzu, The Art of War. I love wow. The Art of War. It's this ancient, Chi- you know what it is, Bo, but your listeners might not. But it's this mm. ancient Chinese doctrine, this philosophy book about war and how to go at war. And a lot of business people use it as, you know, for, for business. And some people don't like that. They don't like equating business with war. But there's a line in this book that I really like. And it's that the best battle is the one that's never fought. Mm. And so I think what most financial advisors that wash out, what happens is they haven't given their clients the tools to know what to do when Mm. the market doesn't go the way we want. After my first downturn, which was 2000 to 2002, I learned very quickly how to avoid that argument ahead of time by trying to tell my client and actually show them and hopefully take them through the emotion that we're going to have when the market goes down. So telling them, A, what the plan's going to be when the market goes down, show them how much their portfolio can go down in most markets, which there's tools out there that can show you that. So show them ahead of time. This is how choppy this is going to be. And I'll give yeah. you an, I'll give you an analogy. I really like it when the when the uh, pilot comes on the plane and says, "Hey, we just put the fasten seatbelt sign on because in about five minutes it's going to get bumpy up here," and then sure. it, and then it gets bumpy and everybody goes, "Yeah, okay, it's just bumpy." But if the pilot hadn't said that, we're all freaking out that you know the guy's up there drunk and we're all about to die. Exactly. Setting expectations is everything, yeah. and also we have I don't know why the gut tells us that when everything goes down that we have to get out. Like, why don't we have this gut reaction that everything goes down and it's a it's a fire sale and, and buy, 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 right? Because that's, that's what you should do unless you're going to be cashing out next year or something. My co-host makes a good point of this. It's easier to do when you're far away from the goal and it's easier to do when you have less money. Like if you mm. have, if you have $10,000 invested, yeah, 
and the market goes down 10%, you're down a thousand bucks. Now don't get me wrong. That's a big dollars. That's decent money. But if you're getting close to retirement and you've built up a nest egg of a million dollars and you wake up a couple of weeks later and your portfolio has lost a hundred thousand dollars, you feel differently, even though it's the same percentage. You're not like, Hey, it's low, baby. I want to buy more. You're like, are you kidding me? I just lost years. Yeah. And if you're, you're in your sixties, yeah. for example, it just hits home, right? If you're, you know, 35 and, and you know, you're not going to be touching that stuff for a while. You may be able to, and maybe you had clients like that who were not too worried and you probably had all, all different kinds, right? I, they were across the board. I had made myself a list of who I needed to call first. And mm. when the market got really jiggly, that's the technical term, Bo, jiggly. <laughs> when I talked about it that way with my clients, they had more confidence in me. Things are getting jiggly now, probably. Well, no, see, that's what I would want, right? <laughs> I think there's different kinds. Like, like I said to Jay Money a couple of weeks ago, I would love a whole company of financial coaches that are like Jay Money, right? Right. Oh, me too. That, that's who I, that's who I trust, and I think people are going the way of somebody who you are familiar with versus somebody who's just like so serious about this or that, right? Even though money is serious, but not that serious. I had a mentor named Katana who taught me that early on, exactly what you're saying, and it's been the same, by the way, for our podcast now. Yes. <laughs> Katana said, you will over time attract people who are like you and you will repel people who aren't. And so when you look at the five-star reviews on our show, those are people. And, and, and when I go meet people, when I go to, you know, to different cities and we have meetups, when I meet people, people that are fans of our show are all people like me. Like they're all people that I would, I would hang out with. And when I read yeah. the one-star reviews now, I'm like, well, th- those people aren't my tribe. They're not my they're not my people and that's okay. Why do they even bother? Like, are they, are they trying to help people by giving one star reviews? Like if anyone else like me happens to come across this show, like run screaming, it's just diluting like the good messages that are coming through. Like, just like the people who say like, uh, yeah, I don't like your face on the YouTube video comment. What is the point of this? Well, I just don't, I don't understand trolls and people who just want to spew negativity. Just leave. Like, Go somewhere else. That's the answer here. Like, this isn't for you. The world is big, right? Uh, You know, I I was allergic to milk for many years, um, and I still am, uh, but, you know, not as much as I was when I was younger. People were like, what did you have for breakfast? How did you have cereal? And I'm like, there are other foods out there. There's there's other things to eat, and it's unbelievable. Everybody couldn't fathom how, how did you live without putting milk on your cereal? I didn't eat cereal. That's the answer. I ate other things. Have you ever heard like toast? Yeah, uh, seriously. Toast or other like, I I don't know. People think that there's one way to do things and and they just don't get they feel like they got to hate on the things that aren't like them. But that's a good segue uh, on to how how you you got into financial media by starting to to go around and touring and talking to people in your company. Yeah. So the first bit. Yeah. So what happened there? I'll get myself out of debt first, if you don't mind, which is. Okay. Yeah, please, please. At, yeah. At, at the end of the way there, I paid my way off and I learned my lesson, which was the cash reserve was super important. And don't take every dollar you have to pay off all the debt and make it, make sure you keep the reserve first. Cause otherwise, you know, your muffler's dragging behind your car later. You got nowhere to go. You got to go right back into debt. And I actually, it wasn't just me. I've met people who did this for, you know, they're coming to me, they're in their fifties and they've been doing this for 30 years into debt, out of debt, into debt, out of debt, into debt, out of debt as because they don't have any emergency funds. So that was, that was drilled into me. Also, I came out stronger because I realized I had the ability to get out of anything. I had the ability. It was all on me. Nobody was going to do it for me. And sure, I come from a, you know, a middle class family where I had a decent background and people talk about privilege. Yeah, I had some of that, but it still came down to me. It came down to what I was going to do with that. And no matter where you start from, you've got to, you got to own up and adult up. And so I, I ended up paying a bunch of money to the internal revenue service that I didn't owe over time. I ended up figuring out that having great people in my corner to protect my blind side was way better than trying to do everything myself. And because I learned from these people, I learned so much. And by the way, and that's why it frustrates me and I'm no longer a financial, I haven't been a financial planner in, in what, 11 years now. 
it frustrates the heck out of me when people are like, no, 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 don't hire good people in your corner. Do it all yourself. Are mm. you fucking kidding? Every smart, rich person. So by the end of my practice, I was doing very well financially. I also was guiding some of the smartest people that I knew. Most of my clients were engineers or vice presidents of the automotive companies or with Microsoft at the end. Okay, yeah. I'm working with brilliant people who know this stuff and they're hiring me. And at first I was like, why would you hire me? Cause you know all this stuff. And then I realized really smart people surround themselves with smart people. They surround themselves with good help. And I had learned how to be good help. So my financial picture got great. I ended up uh, doing very well, but back to, back to, well, we can stay on. I I'm, I'm glad that you summed that up because yeah, like it, it, it always reminds me of Carl Richards when uh, we talk about, you know, why does somebody who's so smart or good with money need an advisor or a planner or a coach? It's the, the somebody between them and stupid, right? <laughs> That's the key uh, right there, right? Like, sure. You want somebody smart, but, but even you just need to have that, that break between like, I want to sell. My gut says to sell. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, think about your financial training. Does that make sense to you? That's all they need you to say. That's why coaches are so valuable. Well, and, and that's the key too, Bo, is it's got to be a coach. Like, I read people on the internet all the time. I'm in these forums lurking, reading, and listening to what people say. And people say, well, I went to two financial advisors. They both really suck. So financial advisors all suck. I'm like, no, man, you got to do a better job of interviewing people in your corner. Yes, there are crappy financial advisors here. Here's a hint. Don't hire them. <laughs> like get better criteria. Yeah. There are tons of stocks out in the stock market. That's like saying I invested in two stocks. They both went south. The lesson is don't invest in stocks. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Stocks and real estate are the two asset classes that have kicked inflation's butt historically over long periods of time. If you don't have stocks or real estate or, you know, maybe both in your portfolio, you're going to have to save maybe dollar for dollar to get there. Or yeah. you're going to bet on things. You know, you're going to have to gamble on in investment classes that go up at irregular intervals. And we, you don't want to do that. So wrong message. Hire good people in your corner. And if you get a bad person, fire them and then find somebody think about what in my process was bad when I hired that person. And how do I not replicate that experience? L like I had a crappy tax advisor. I paid the IRS a bunch of money that I probably wouldn't have owed had I gotten good tax help from the very beginning. And even better than that, had I taken the time to understand how things worked, right? I paid back all these bills I didn't owe. I learned from that. I have great tax help now. My dude, Dan Leonard, who takes care of my taxes, I'll say a big hi to Dan. Dan's in California. He's a phenomenal tax expert. I also have a bookkeeper, Catherine Pomerantz. She's amazing. My bookkeeper takes care of me on a day-to-day -day basis. My tax advisor, Dan, is phenomenal. I know how to keep books. I know how to do taxes. Yeah. I know them completely. These, these people are, to your point, Carl Richards point. They they're between me and stupid. There's another piece though. I'm married. My wife has heard my crap over and over and over. So <laughs> when I say something's good, that's one thing. If Dan says something's good, Dan's not a member of our family. And if Dan likes it, Cheryl's on board. If I say it, she's like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so many good people, especially when you get to the point when you can afford them, because you then have even more to lose. Yeah. Right. The people that need the good people the most are the ones that, you know, say doctors, lawyers. No, I'm going to push back on that. I think you okay. can find good people. Now, they, they don't have to be the pros. Like when I was first getting my act together, I was first getting good. I had this guy that hired me. And he ended up being a, an awesome client. He managed a, a machine shop. And he said, you know what? He looked at my price to hire me and he goes, I have this real feeling you're on your way up. And I'm going to tell you this now so you don't forget it later. I'm going to take a bet on you early so that mm. you're still with me when you're not working with people like me. He was always one of my favorite clients because he bet up early. So you can bet on, you know, I say don't hire people <laughs> that are in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said that. Yeah. So if, but if you can find people who are these up and coming performers, that's one. Number two is there are groups of people that are smart people. It doesn't have to be somebody you pay. There can be somebody, I interviewed a football player once and um, he didn't have a traditional financial advisor. He actually found a really rich guy in his town. 
and just said, can you mentor me? Yeah. Chad Carson, who does real estate, did the same thing. He got under a guy's wing and learned real estate. It was not hiring a professional. It was having somebody who's smart with people that he just, he went to breakfast with sometimes. And these people bestowed their knowledge. They trusted these people with uh, some facts about their life so that they could help them get. There are plenty of people that want to mentor people. And I think whether you've got $10, $100, $1,000 or a million dollars, it's all the money you've got. Like, God, if I could have had great financial help when I was really struggling there in the early days, you know, somebody to teach me to be the parent that I didn't have, that would have been awesome. And now there's so many blogs and podcasts and everybody reviewing everybody else and a million second opinions. And I mean, I know you guys uh, tell people to not listen to you, uh, your advice, (laughs) Uh, uh, you and OG, right? That's your official disclaimer. Yeah. Don't, please do not do anything. Yeah. If if you learn something listening to our show, keep it to yourself because you'll ruin our reputation. But I, I'm just going to guess that, uh, you know, you people would love for like you or I mean, if OG was uh, not uh, anonymous uh, to be their coach, like, you know, have you had requests? Do people request that from you at all? They don't request it from me because I think that they know that I don't want to do that anymore. But you're, yeah, you're past it. Yeah. 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 And OG is a financial planner at the end of some of our shows. We do say that how do we have to say for compliance reasons, he's a certified financial planner. So he has to be without the anonymity. He has to be findable. So if you head to MackieBenjamins.com forward slash OG, you'll see his practice, his real name, who he is. You can find out exactly who he is. We cannot hide. I mean, legally. It's funny. I thought that I did that. I thought that OG was anonymous, but he's not. No. Well, he is, but it's got to be easily findable was what his compliance officer uh, told him. So, which I think is correct. You know, he can have the bag over his head, but at the same time, there's got to be accountability on what we say. Does OG get business then from the podcast? Yeah, I think, I don't know how many clients he took on last year, but he, he had his best year ever as an advisor in terms of uh, bringing on new clients Uh, to the point that for a long time this year, he wasn't taking new clients because that's amazing. Want to make sure his process could handle the number of people that was he was working with. Sometimes like, you know, if you have a favorite podcast, somebody you listen to, it's like you I trust this person. I trust what they're saying. And I don't know, like sometimes you can just trust what somebody's saying. Okay, so the you're you started in the media you were on what detroit tv is that uh, uh how you got started? i was yeah well actually the way i got started was that 100 advisors left american express on the same day okay. <laughs> that, that's how it all started and when that happened and i didn't go obviously the collective management at american express went oh crap 100 yeah. people this is a horrible story for us so they hired crisis pr people to come in to deal with the situation and make it better. Wow. Companies hire companies to say, how do we get through this? So the media doesn't beat the hell out of us because of this huge exodus of people leaving on the same day. Well, one thing they did from the advisors that were still there, they formed this committee of people that were um, experts in different areas. And I became the college planning expert. I had already been giving talks before these advisors left. I had become part of a group uh, locally that gave the rubber chicken dinners for advisors. So I've been doing that for a few yeah. years, but now, so this would have been seven years into my career. I become this college planning expert who's on TV. But what, what a lot of these advisors didn't realize about media is that media doesn't media can't do it between three and four thirty Cause that's the only time you have available. Media is going to want to do it when they want to do it. And you have to bend. And I knew enough about media and I've been media obsessed enough that I knew that. So I started getting calls. So I did a couple college planning pieces and I was decent radio and I was decent TV for them. And then these other advisors weren't available. So they would call me as a backup. And before you knew it, the whole group of all these different people were gone. And I became the lead media person in Detroit for because you were available because I was available and I didn't <laughs> suck. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm going to so, give you more credit than that, but yes. <laughs> so then uh, the local TV station called and said, Hey, we're thinking about getting a money man quote money man and hmm. he'll come on TV once a week and do these money tips. And I said, 
I, you know, and they came to me and I'm like, uh, no, 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 no. Cause I'd done a lot of radio and radio was pretty easy because yeah. I could, from my DJ days, I can control my voice when I'm nervous, but controlling that, oh hell, look on your face. On the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. You can't do it. But then I realized the dirty secret, which is those, those segments I'd like for so long on TV that everybody sees the guest actually writes those because ah. you're a subject matter expert and the producers don't know what it is. They're going to clean it up and they're going to ask stuff their way. But mm. generally speaking, when our anchor, Carolyn Clifford in Detroit would ask questions to me, they were very close to the questions I'd written the week before. And so all of a sudden I'm very comfortable on TV. I know the Perfect. questions that are coming and I'm able to look brilliant. And so they increased uh, the number of spots from one to two. I started uh, then working on a national level where I became one of 12 people in the United States that was a financial planner with the company that was allowed to speak first and go through compliance later. Meaning when the yeah. media would call and I, I've been on everything when a Wall Street Journal would call or a magazine would call or a newspaper would call, uh, Chicago Sun-Times would call, uh, I could do the spot and then I would send it through to a compliance officer to make sure that I hadn't broken any rules because I'd had so much media training to get that job that I was dependable. That's a big deal. It's, it's a lot of freedom to be able to, yeah, so you speak first and that's permission later yeah. <laughs> Forgi yeah. forgiveness well sometimes. they had to have a lot of confidence that i wasn't going to throw <laughs> the company under the bus right that's that's right that's yeah. right yeah so yeah i think we have to fast forward into i like to spend a lot of time on the on the first part like yeah. your the origin story because yeah. that's that's important but i want to get to how stacking benjamins was created then obviously you're now on a national level to get there very quickly what happened was i worked in an industry where you didn't you know write a letter that you're leaving in 2 weeks yeah, you didn't okay. give your 2 weeks notice you'd leave like those 100 advisors did you'd leave at midnight with the client files right? <laughs> and so uh, but but my mentor actually did that he wrote a 2 weeks notice i'm i'm retiring Mm. And he was 38. I was 40. He was 38. And he had made tons of money. He'd been a great mentor of mine and several other people. And in his letter, he said, listen, I really like this financial planning stuff. I think it's really fun. It's enriching. It's been a wonderful career. But unless Shirley MacLaine is right, you know, she's that actress who thinks we all get reincarnated. Unless she's right, I have one life. I have one shot to do all these different things I want to do. He said, so I've been very blessed that I've gotten this, this nice sum of money and I'm going to go climb other mountains. I really want to go. I have other mountains to climb, he said, which is funny, Bo, because he ended up climbing Mount Everest twice after that. So he's climbed most of the highest peaks in the world. And he now runs an adventure travel company in Colorado. Wow. So actual literal mountains, literal. <laughs> yes. actual mountains to climb. Amazing. But me, there were probably a group of four of us. And of the four of us, I think three of us left within the next two years because I realized that my life is finite. And while I really liked being a financial planner, I thought I wanted to do other things. My business was franchise. That's the way they got away with us being independent contractors. Ah. So I own my franchise. I then was able to sell my franchise for a nice mid to high six figure number. I okay. sold that, the franchise and I went back to school to become a high school teacher and a track coach. I was going to teach English and coach high school track, which wow. my wife and I met. Okay. And, uh, now I was going to do the thing that I would really love. Well, I was really bored in school and my friends that were also people that had done media said, can you start writing my scripts for me? Cause I was, they always liked my scripts. So I started writing scripts for some money. And then I started doing some writing of advisors, newsletters to their clients, talking about the markets and stuff. And then I, I said, you know what? I think I could just write online some, and maybe we can just fund our vacations of me having fun writing. So I started I like I paid for the holidays one year by just writing online for other people. And wow. uh, then I realized I should have a blog. And a friend of mine who'd been a financial planner with me, who now we call OG on the show, I was talking <laughs> to him about it. He's like, let's do it together. So we've we founded this first blog. That went okay, but OG's not a writer at all. But he and I had done radio before along the way, and we had pretty decent chemistry. And we always talked about having a podcast, but I never, I didn't want a Me Too podcast. 
I didn't want to do at that point. There was like Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman. And I'm like, there's nothing for me to say that they're not saying one day I'm mowing my lawn and I'm listening to NPR and these uh, two guys click and clack. They have this show called Car Talk. By the way, one of the guys died, but they still do reruns all the time at Car Talk. Okay. They're pretty evergreen. The basis of the show was they would answer people's car questions, but it wasn't about learning anything. I realized I wasn't learning crap listening to Car Talk. <laughs> I'm just laughing with these two guys because they're having yeah. so much fun. And I know nothing about cars, but I'm completely getting enveloped in car culture. And all of a sudden I went, holy cow, there's nobody doing this with money shows. And I love the Tonight Show. I love the pace of like a Tonight Show with different segments. So yeah. we we took the vibe of car talk where we're not trying to teach anything and we're just trying to envelop you in money culture. And we took the structure of a late night talk show and we put those two together. And that's that's how Stacking Benjamins was born. But But one more thing, we joke about not learning anything. I also was studying the science of play and I'm a guy that likes board games and I sincerely believe that you learn a ton more when you think you're not learning. When I'm not trying to learn stuff, I'm just having fun. Man, I'm learning a ton during those times of my life. So we're actually, and and I shouldn't say this out loud because this is kind of a secret, but we're intensely interested in you learning. And we try to, we actually do try to teach you five different concepts a day. And because it's a variety show, we try to make sure that we're all over the place in any episode. So if one thing's not hitting you, we're going to hit you 10 minutes later with something on a completely different topic. I'm going to edit that whole part out. So good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this, this I wouldn't want you to get a bad reputation right. of, of actually <laughs> teaching, even though you are a, a teacher uh, which I, I guess I, you know, I try to learn a little bit about guests and then I forget that so that I can have an interesting interview. So, <laughs> so I never read that, uh, about, uh, you being a, a high school teacher. I never got there. Things took you off. Never even got there. Nope. Things took oh, off. Oh, before you never even got to, uh, uh, actually teach. Okay. Okay. I took a full year of classes, but I was bored. And I also was learning mm-hmm. that I would fight administration. And even though I would love the kids, the teaching process was teaching two tests, not actually teaching kids. It was becoming, it's becoming checkbox in the United States. Yeah. And I'm like, why am I going to do this when I could teach people about, and at the same time, the blog was starting to go a little bit. We're talking about maybe doing a podcast and I'm like, you know what? I'm sitting in shorts and a t-shirt having fun teaching people my way. So I quit school and decided to do this full time then at the time. Yeah, I'm realizing uh, I could probably talk to you for three more hours because uh, I, you know, I have all these questions like, how did you end up in Texas? And then now you're back in, in Michigan. I am. Um, but I want to address the gamification thing that you said sure. because it's so important. Uh, they're talk- The gamification for teaching kids, especially with apps these days, like, hey, you, you know, competing against your friends for your savings goal. These things are amazing. And yeah, you're right. Like, the way that you guys have it set up, especially with the uh, Doug and, and trivia, the trivia doesn't uh, like sometimes has to do with money, right? Sometimes has nothing to do with money. We either tie it in with money or we tie it in with the theme. And the theme is okay. Doug, yeah, Doug generally has a story arc. We try to have a small story arc. Yeah, where usually Doug at the beginning of the show is screwing something up. And only he knows he's screwing it up. Everybody else thinks he's an idiot. And uh, midway through the show, then he gets an aha. But the trivia either ties into the theme or ties into money. Yeah. And then you have a running competition between the what it's the round table gets or the regular round table people. Yes. Yeah. So when you come on, what we do is because our, our round table has been with us for a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. Len Penzo has been there since episode one and Paula wow. has been there probably since episode maybe 30. They've been there the whole, what, eight years of the show. I've known these people for a long time uh, and they've they've done great for us. By the way, they're only on our Friday show. So yeah, okay. Monday, Monday and Wednesday, it's just OG and I and Doug and I. Doug, Doug still does trivia, but it's easier and it's aimed at the audience. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, trivia is aimed at, at everybody listening and we try to make it easy enough that you've got a shot of getting it right. On Friday... We make it super hard and we play it price is right style between our participants, our round table participants on Friday. We play, you know, closest without going over, gets it right, which, which means that people are vicious. 
they've learned to be vicious. And people will generally go one dollar over the next one to make sure they squash the other person's chance of winning, which is pretty fun. Yeah, I've I've listened to a couple of those, and somebody's like, I don't know, year one, and when they're trying to guess like what year did this thing happen, I'm gonna pick year one because everyone else is over. Yeah, everybody else is like 1870, and I think it happened in 1830. So I'll say year one. Yeah, year one, I'm covered. I'm good. Those ones are so hard. I, I mean, I don't know how anyone would get it unless they like knew. Friday, we do that on purpose to make yeah. it fun. Uh, and that's by the way, pattern. You know, there's a great book by the way called steal like an artist and it's austin cleon wrote it it's a phenomenal all of austin cleon's work is phenomenal i'm a huge fanboy but steal like an artist says there there isn't any artist out there who got there on themselves there's this general thing that you're always building on right so Mm. artists are always inspired by stuff so think about this if you're going to create any art and i look at our show as art our, our detractors may say differently, but I think I, about it as my I agree, I art agree. project. When you're creating art, who inspires you and how do you not rip that off? Like don't rip it off, but how do you remix it? How do you pay homage to it? People that listen to our show don't think about it like the tonight show. But now that I just said it on your show, if somebody comes from here and goes and listens to our show, you'll hear the tonight show now. Like you've mm. never known though, without me saying that, but, but the trivia is based on, there's a, a board game I like called wits and wagers and okay. wits and wagers is a game where you will never know the answer to the question and you play to be the closest one. So okay. every, everybody makes a bet in the game about what they think it is. So how many miles is the earth from the moon will be, yeah. <laughs> you know, how many number one hits has Madonna had? These questions that you're like, uh, I had 30. Yeah. I, nobody knows the right, the precise answer, but they might get close. Yeah. So on Fridays, on Fridays, we try to do that. We try to make it where how many uh, gallons of popcorn does, did it take to fill up the Empire State Building? That was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And yeah, three shows a week. Uh, you know, I was listening. I was just downloading whichever ones uh, were coming up. I, I only started listening to you guys on the way down to Orlando. I only became aware of so of of so many podcasts once I started to get into the FinCon uh, network, and once I had a podcast of my own. And I always thought, well, a lot of the American ones are, you know, they're not for me because I need to know about TFSAs and RRSPs and right. things like that. I don't know what a Roth IRA is. And, uh, but uh, I realized a lot of the stuff is cross border, and a lot of the stuff that I talk about is cross border too. And you're basically in Canada uh, yourself right now. Um, <laughs> you know, you're you're more north than uh, I'm. I'm north in Windsor. Yeah, exactly. I'm north. Are you, are you in like a uh, north part of Detroit? I am. Yeah. I'm at Detroit is mile roads as you go north. So yeah. anybody that knows the Eminem movie, eight mile, yeah, eight mile. Yeah. yeah. Eight mile is the border between Detroit proper and the suburbs. I live at 18 mile. So okay. that should tell everybody where I, I live 18 miles north of Detroit. So you are in Canada basically now. And I, I'd love to talk about the move, you know, from Texas back. But I think, uh, we got to call it a day for today. I will say one thing when you're talking about learning about podcasts, I, mm. I address that as one of the earlier podcasts in our, in our spot. There were a few before us, but not like there are now. Please. I've had some people ask me like, so, so give me the dirt show, which podcast don't you like, which, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the bad news is, is that we, we don't have time for that just as a community between you and I and, and people listening, we need more people listening. We have a podcast yeah. that on the American side is almost always in the top 20 podcasts in the investing category on iTunes. Our audience size, total audience size, not who listens to every episode, but there's a company called PodTrack that tracks yeah. our audience. Our audience is about 130,000 people. There's over 300 million people in the United States. Yeah, there's. I don't know what the population of Canada is, but the bad news is we have so many great shows like yours, the Choose FI guys, Jamila with Failure to Launch. On the Canadian side, between Jessica Morehouse, yeah. Tom Drake, your show. I mean, there's so many great shows to listen to. Like we don't have we don't have time to quibble. Like people ask me, no, like, more, bring them more. We need more podcast. We need more of these shows 
to be available. And, um, and I just get so excited when I see another new show, I'm like, we're one step closer to world domination, but, but <laughs> we're nowhere close to world domination. I look at this, no. our audience and I'm like, man, we need more people to listen. That's it. And, and, and to answer your uh, question from earlier, it's about 10 to one in terms of the size of the U S to Canada, uh, yeah. generally how it goes. And, uh, you know, the financial literacy, uh, you know, percentage of people who actually know what they're doing is about the same. You know, it, it's uh, it's not enough. Not enough people uh, are understanding the basics. I love that light bulb you said, though, Bo, about being on your way to Orlando and going, wow, these are pretty good. You know, and I think that yeah. that's the average response we get from people is that yeah, <laughs> financial show like we we told somebody, an old client of mine got back in touch with me and said, said, so what are you doing? You're doing this podcast thing. I said, yeah. And they go and they go, well, you know, that sounds pretty academic. I'm like, I don't think you know what we do. Yeah. What? <laughs> like, like, like that's we, odd. we've played comedy clubs live and people yes. have actually laughed. So it's and so they came to our live show in Detroit. And this guy, Steve, he goes, I never knew. And then now he's writing me going, I'm finding all these other shows. These financial shows are fun. To your point of um, we need more. Uh, one of my favorite stories of the last two years is someone I met at FinCon 2017. It's Eric Brotman. Uh, he's a CFP. And he didn't know about podcasts until he went to FinCon. And now he has a podcast. He built a studio in his in his office, uh, Broadman Financial Group, BFG now, which is awesome because it's like the movie, <laughs> BFG. Uh, the BFG. So good. And he, like, you know, I he's he looked to me for advice. Like, this is a guy who's been doing this for a long time. Great guy. He's been, you know, he was doing what you, what you were doing, right? And he's still doing it. And he was just like, this is these are my people. This is my world, and I want to podcast and. It's a great podcast called Don't Retire, Graduate. I was just on a most recent episode um, because I agree with that concept too. You and I could talk forever. I know that we could. And I'm I'm looking forward to being on the show. I don't know when it's going to air, but I will be talking with you guys next week. Yeah, and and I think we're going to air in about three weeks. But if if people just go to the listings, you you'll see it. But probably about three weeks out. I can't wait to see how you do on our trivia. Oh man! So that that all be a Friday show. We, That's the round table, yes. and we always try to cater our trivia a little bit toward our guests. So it oh may be God. something Canadian. Where when we, was the when was the toonie uh, uh, <laughs> uh, invented? Or what, we what? <laughs> throw you under the bus? Thing. What's on the back of the the two dollar bill? That's in right. Canada. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's awesome. I, I, I'm really, thanks so much for inviting me on. Thanks for coming on this show. I love telling people's stories and I'm realizing more and more as I'm doing these, one episode is never enough, especially if someone has, uh, you know, has had a lot of things happen in a financial uh, way as you have. Well, thanks for having me. And this has been fun. And I'm a big fan. I love this long form. We don't get to do long form on my show, so I don't get to tell the story. So thank you so much. Well, perfect. We'll see you, uh, see you next week. And that was episode 94 with Joe Salcihai. If you like the podcast and want to see me get to episode 100 and beyond, please support the podcast by going to my Patreon site and becoming a patron. It's only a few bucks a week, but if enough people do it, it starts to add up. Head over to patreon.com slash bowhumphreys if you're interested. And that's it for this episode. I'll be back next week with Dr. Bettina Schneider, Associate Professor and Associate Vice President Academic at First Nations University of Canada.